Hey folks, welcome to OutDrive. I'm Cliff Callis, and I'm here to bring you actionable marketing insights you can apply to reach, connect with, and convert rural American consumers. Join me in the front seat as we head out on the road to success. Let's go. That's really part of my focus, uh, focused on our strategy in our food and beverage market, but uh, being well-read, attending conferences, having that external perspective, you know, that you, you got to have a radar. You got to understand, you know, what's going on around you and then how do you pivot left or right to be ready for some of those changes. You know, attention spans have changed a lot. So when I, I sit and look at, uh, you know, how fast things come before us in ads, you know, those 15 second ads and you kind of look and you're like, oh my goodness, what has changed in this market? But I, I just think that's where the where we're all heading is that you got to grab attention way faster than maybe some of us that used to tell longer stories back in the day. Now we got to do it in bullets versus in paragraphs, right? Be proud of where you're from, right? As we talked earlier about innovation and things that take place in the Midwest, and you know, I. As I spend time across America, I think folks are probably realizing when they do visit, uh, you know, rural parts of America that uh, there's something wholesome. And so we, we should be unapologetic about where we're from. Hey, folks, we've got another great story to share with you today on OutDrive about life and work in rural America. I met our guest, Jason Robertson, over 20 years ago when he was getting his start in business development. He was working for Interstates Electric in Iowa and volunteering his time with the Associated Builders and Contractors of Iowa, who was a client at the time and where we worked with Jason on a number of marketing initiatives. Today, Jason is the Vice President of Food and Beverage at CRB, an engineering, architecture, construction, and consulting firm. CRB specializes in building solutions for innovative products and facilities in the life science industry, biotech, pharmaceuticals, and food and beverage. Jason earned his bachelor's degree in business administration from Northwestern College, and he currently lives in Kansas City. As a former client and longtime acquaintance, I've got to know Jason well over the years, and I can tell you he has an incredibly high IQ in innovative sales and marketing. I'm looking forward to picking his brain on today's podcast. Welcome to OutDrive, Jason. Cliff, good to see you again. And you as well. You know, I uh, enjoyed catching up a couple of weeks ago. It had been a few years. It's amazing that it's been about 20 since we worked together on the uh, Associated Builders and Contractors of Iowa Marketing Initiatives. You know, looking back, I didn't realize that you were really just getting started in your career at that time because you, you always seem so mature, so professional. Have you always been that way? Have you always found it easy to talk to, you know, people of all ages? Yeah, you know, I was, you know, really blessed with the gift of gab. I joined, you know, really when I started, uh, I tell people that early in my, uh, you know, high school and college days, I worked at a full service gas station. And, you know, those are somewhat unique these days, of course, but, uh, you know, every, every five minutes, you had a new client with a, with a new challenge and a new need. And so being able to strike up a conversation with the elderly lady that, you know, needed something under the hood to, you know, bugs or a flat tire or something. And so I just always enjoyed that. So when I moved into business development, it was just kind of a gift to gab to be able to strike up a conversation and talk about lots of different things from the weather to what, what might be on people's minds. So, but yeah, I didn't have as much gray hair, you know, as I do now back in those days. So yeah, mature by gift of gab, but certainly uh, now it's uh, the mirror doesn't lie, so to speak. Right. Well, you talked about that experience working with really the consumers at ground level zero. Uh, you know, I think every young person ought to work in some sort of an environment like that, whether it's a retail store, restaurant, a uh, convenience store, whatever it is, because that's, that's some life lessons that you're not going to pick up anywhere else. Well, I have a 17 year old that's uh, in his senior year and I'm totally there with you. And, you know, in the future, I hope that we won't be send sending our proposals via Snapchat or some other, you know, social media platform. But uh, 
I think it's healthy to get folks out and to be able to look up from the screen, look people straight in the eye and have that relationship building skill. And I think that goes for all of us, but certainly we're, we're heading towards a generation where I'll text you, you know, versus call somebody. And um, I do get accused every once in a while in our organization that Jason, you're the only one that actually calls me on my desk phone. So it's kind of humbling that uh, I might be getting to be that older generation accused of those things. So anyway. Well, I think the young person who is willing to pick up a phone or have a face-to-face -face somebody has a huge advantage over somebody who has no interest or talent in to be able to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think those are skills that, you know, how do you teach as a parent? How do you teach as, you know, maybe coaching some of our younger folks in our organizations that, you know, it's not all about, you know, it, a text or, you know, let's call, let's have that conversation. Let's work through some of those, uh, you know, crucial conversations, if you will, around, you know, some tough topics. So yeah, important life skills, you know, you mentioned the uh, full service filling station, gas station, uh, which, which is kind of a thing of the past. But, you know, as I think about, and I've talked to my wife about this from time to time, as you think about the convenience society that we live in, and then, and then we just, you know, we're sort of if hopefully at the tail end of the pandemic. And I think the full service gas station, assuming there was a financial formula and model that would make it work, I think people would be all over that. You don't have to get out of your car. You don't have to touch the gas pump. You don't have to put it in your card. You know, somebody walks up, fill her up. Yep, that's right. Yeah, no, it's uh, I, I have fond memories of those days, even though, uh, you know, I tell people that it probably toughened me up that, uh, you know, in North Central Iowa, and then when I went to college in Northwest Iowa, where the temperatures and the, the breeze, there were days there was minus 30, you know, with the wind chill, and there we were pumping gas. And when school buses or these large vehicles came up and you're out there kind of doing a little dance just to stay warm. But uh, I tell people that that kind of shaped me who I am today. And I have fond memories. I would, I mean, I would, looking back to your point, I don't know if I'd do it any other way. Yeah. Great memories. Tell us more about your background growing up in uh, central Iowa. Yeah, I grew up uh, in North Central Iowa, about an hour south of the Minnesota border, a town uh, by the name of Belmont, Iowa, 2,500 uh, folks, a farming community. My dad was an agronomist uh, for a seed company. So what that really means is developing new hybrids for corn traits and, you know, what particular plants are the best in different soils. And so, you know, it was a unique farming kind of background. Of course, I had friends that were farming specifically. So I got that flavor of assisting their parents of, you know, uh, hauling grain to town or whatever that might be. And so, you know, I look back and I tell folks that my heart's in Iowa, but I happen to live in Kansas now. But that's truly the deal. I, I enjoy where I'm from. It's always good to get back for holidays and to see family there. But uh, I started in the design and construction business working for, uh, you know, in my high school days in college uh, for a small electrical contractor. And that's where I got my connection to Associated Builders and Contractors, uh, a merit shop uh, trade association and uh, where you and I interacted. Right. But, you know, it was a great upbringing to where I really, after college, got my first opportunity to get into the, the business as somebody that didn't wear a tool belt, but focused on business development and a little bit of estimating. Uh, building ethanol, biodiesel, soybean extraction plants, food and beverage. So that took me across, you know, to the theme of your podcast, to a lot of rural parts of uh, America and certainly enjoyed every bit of that to meet people. So when I meet new people and I ask where they're from, they're like, well, you, you wouldn't know where I'm from. I said, well, give me, let's give it a try. And so they're always amazed. I'm like, oh yeah, that restaurant at that corner, or, you know, or been there in that hotel. So that's just you know, that's part of the joy of, uh, you know, being a guy that's traveled all over the country for a living for the last many years. So, well, you know, the, the focus of our podcast really is to help people better understand what rural America is all about and the people of rural America. Describe it from your perspective. Yeah. You know, well, greetings from San Diego. You know, uh, we have an office here. And so I'm sitting in my hotel room uh, with you today. I think what's unique about rural America is the innovation, the work ethic uh, that takes place. And I saw it in my small town. I see it in, in a lot of places uh, across rural America. And so for those that might uh, 
you know, the generations that feel like they have to go to New York and, you know, LA to succeed, you know, I would, I'd love to have conversations with them about that because I could have easily done that, but I see that there's rewarding opportunity in the Midwest, uh, the, the people, you know, I was at, you know, kind of a happy hour last night with colleagues of our San Diego office, and they were comparing the price per square foot of homes. And they were at $625 a square foot for what their homes were. And, you know, if you look at Kansas City, it's probably in that two to three, you know, three range or, you know, it varies, but much right. different. And so you think, well, if you work hard and, you know, you have rewarding opportunities in the Midwest or anywhere in rural America for that matter, you know, why do you need to get distracted by, you know, the, the bright city lights, if you will. And so, like I said, I've always appreciated my upbringing and, uh, you know, when uh, you have colleagues that join us in meetings in the Midwest, it's always interesting when they say, man, people say hello to us and they're so uh, pleasant to be around. And I think that's what, you know, that's what it's all about is, you know, that golden rule. And and that's what kept me in the Midwest and, and why I enjoy, you know, learning what people's stories are and what I do for a living and building relationships. Well, you, you know, when we talked a couple of weeks ago and we were kind of catching up, you talked about how a lot of the projects that you guys work on are, you know, I guess, greenfield projects out in rural America, right? In many cases. So, you know, CRB focuses on uh, the biotech, food and beverage, business, science and technology, designing and building vaccines. And, and you know, I'm focused on leading our food and beverage uh, segments. So, yes, absolutely. In our food and beverage case, uh, those jobs are generally generated by where the feedstock or the, you know, but we'll see things on the coast as well. But yeah, we will find ourselves in rural America, you know, staying at small town USA hotels from a greenfield construction perspective, where you find some of those food and beverage plants is uh, north to south, east to west. When you talked about innovation earlier, and I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, there is so much innovation you know, really across the country, but certainly out in rural America. And I know that you guys are uh, partnering with some pretty innovative people. Talk a little bit about those experiences. Yeah. So our life science business was very unique that, you know, CRB's roots has started in life sciences. So helping clients really scale from bench to commercial scale. Uh, a lot of the technologies you'll find in, in the pharmacy or, you know, in an ER, for instance, so we were real blessed to be a part with some existing relationships to really help a lot of the COVID vaccine scale. And so that was 2020 was an interesting year for our company, you know, really at, uh, ex well, the speed of which the, that process really took place was quite amazing. And then on our food and beverage market, the level of innovation in food as we look at what's going on in the grocery store and really what the consumer demands are taking place is, we're looking for fresh, clean label products. And so some of those products that we grew up on uh, are changing a lot. And so we find ourselves in the alternative protein space of uh, plant and cellular meats. You know, it's just uh, helping folks that uh, might have an alternative kind of uh, protein desire in their, their diet. And so it's been a very unique and our company, with having a biotech background coupled with food and beverage, has been a nice complement as we meet new clients in that space. But they're venture capital backed by major, major investors. So it's been a really interesting ride the last several years of innovation that's taking place. And, you know, as uh, what you see in the grocery store is, it's been really something. Well, I think both of those are great examples of real true marketing, you know, identifying opportunities and then filling needs of, of customers. What's the process for how that came to be within your organization? Well, yeah, I think it's a, it's really good market research. You could say, well, we really had good marketing uh, research there. That that's part of it. But I think the other thing is just uh, is anticipating where the market's going to go. And that's really part of my focus, stra uh, focused on our strategy in our food and beverage market, but uh, being well-read, attending conferences, having that external perspective, you know, that uh, you, you got to have a radar. You got to understand, you know, what's going on around you and then how do you pivot left or right to be ready for some of those changes. And then certainly 
the last couple of years, 18 months, you know, we never thought that the, the food business would explode like it is, but who would have ever thought that uh, there wasn't enough toilet paper that, uh, you know, could have been kept on shelves. And so the, the racing to the grocery store and regular stores to, to you know, stock the, the shelves, they called that pantry packing, so to speak, uh, that really just uh, disrupted the food industry. And so we were in some unique spots uh, to really be ready and poised. In addition to that, you know, Cliff, uh, we've uh, been highly involved in the design and construction of pet food manufacturing facilities. And I was told recently by a, an ingredient supplier that there were about 14 million pets adopted during COVID. You know, so we're all at home, we're thinking about companionship and we want to add to the family and you know, the young pet now is treated identical to what maybe a son or a daughter is. And so now we got to make sure that we're feeding them really great pet food and treats. And, and so that market has just absolutely exploded. And, you know, so, you know, it's created some nice opportunities for us. That's interesting. I hadn't heard that statistic. Certainly COVID has changed a lot of things. And, you know, that's a good one from my perspective. I think pets are good for certainly good for kids are great for families. And you're right. People treat them just like another child. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, you talked about traveling, uh, to association meetings and of course you're in San Diego this week. And I think the last time we visited, you were getting ready to go to a trade show. Yep. Talk a little bit about that one. Cause that was the first one you had been to since 17 the months. Yeah, yeah. The first one in 17 months took place in Charlotte in the snack industry, you know, it was uh, interesting. Uh, they were first out of the gate and, uh, you know, here over the next several weeks, there's several more that are scheduled. And so it's the new life of what uh, I think a lot of folks will be eager to get out. But, you know, the mask mandate uh, was present and certainly, you know, for folks that might work for organizations that might need a check-in procedure that this was a very similar uh, check-in procedure that we did every day before you got to the Charlotte Convention Center. And so, you know, it's kind of the new, the new way of life, if you will. And so I've not run into any situations yet where I've had to show my vaccination card, but I'm prepared for that. But yeah, it's just a few questions and then show to the security person coming into the, the trade hall that day and then masks inside the you know, trade shows. You, so you, when you try to build a relationship with a mask on, you know, I know all of us have, you know, it's, it's long, it's been a long journey with these masks and we're all eager to get to a point where we could, you know, throw them in the trash and move on. But, uh, you know, I think it's, we got to kind of journey on a little bit right now within the kind of current conditions. So was the show well attended? Yeah, uh, it was. I mean, certainly not to the levels it was pre-COVID, but, you know, business has got to continue to go on, uh, you know, with the the vast growth in the business. A lot of these individuals and companies are out looking for new technology and new equipment. And, and certainly, you know, uh, I was impressed to see the turnout. You know, you mentioned innovation and companies looking for that. And I remember the last trade show that the last big trade show that I went to was January of 2020 in Vegas. And I noted, cause I did sort of a debrief article about it for our agency library, that innovation was the thing that was driving new business. You could just, you could walk around the trade show and the people that had innovative products and services had people at their booths and the ones that didn't, didn't. And uh, I think that's going to be even more prevalent now. Absolutely. No, it, uh, and it's, it's, I think it's happening at a quicker pace. You know, I think the, um, the adaptation of Zoom and Teams as our company, we, we were spread out with 20 offices around the globe. Zoom and Teams was not a new thing to us. So, you know, the way we charged into that and tackled some of those challenges as we grew, and I think many other companies are probably like, you know, we, you can't accomplish things by Zoom you, and, and Teams. You just got to learn to adapt and, and, and uh, be engaged. And so I often joke, pre-COVID, you know, I'd sit on airplanes and I'd see the duct tape on top of the camera and you could, you know, you, you could judge very quickly the level of engagement of, you know, the people that wanted to be on calls. Or Now I think you got to clean the duct tape off your camera because the last 18 months or whatever it's been, you know, to, you've had to be a little more present. 
So yeah, rip the bandaid off. You're on right? there. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I really have always admired your sales professionalism. What kind of advice would you give to somebody who's planning for a trade show? How do you guys prepare for a trade show from a sales perspective? Yeah, well, I was just on a call this morning about that very topic as we look at the next several weeks with, uh, for some reason in our industry, all the shows got canceled and pushed out to September, October. So it's going to be a very busy next six, uh, six weeks or so. But, um, you know, I would think that, you know, being being open-minded, you know, and being prepared and, and meeting people where they are. I have certainly strong opinions about this whole thing and how it, but, you know, if there's a mask on with somebody and you meet, uh, you know, certainly meeting where they are to, to, to reduce the stress and some of that, I've noticed even, you know, shaking of hands or the fist pumps, whatever that might be at our trade show booth, specifically having, you know, some of the hand sanitizer, you know, there where folks feel like they can, you know, no different than a grocery store when wiping the cart or uh, just having it present. You know, the other thing, both of us having backgrounds in marketing and business development, the other thing that uh, we did was let's not take a bunch of paper and materials in that booth. Let's have a QR code where folks can engage us at a different level on their phone. And since we're all used to ordering our, our restaurant, uh, seeing our restaurant menus, you know, that QR code kind of came back to popularity and being used. And so we did that for that show, had a little stand. And so now you can interact, hit our website, maybe, you know, uh, plug in with your information to opt in and some of our material. So I think that was another novel idea that our team came up with. So those are some things that, you know, that probably come to mind, Cliff. Yeah, those are great. Those are great ideas specific to trade shows. What other kinds of sales and marketing strategies are, are you using that you can share with us in your business that are, that are generating a solid ROI? Yeah, yeah. For us, it's what we've found in the last several years. We've really doubled down on our investment and in thought leadership. So I have a dedicated person within our market that uh, thinks about how are we out telling our story and engaging. The, the days of just having a, a static website are gone, as we all know, but, but uh, you got to have a reason to continue to invite people back. You know, if you follow us on LinkedIn or me personally to see on Twitter, what I'm up, up, you know, talking about is that we've really tried to position our subject matter experts in our business to be out creating a conversation around, you know, key trends and uh, what's going on in the industry. And so whether that's by video or being interviewed with trade publications or doing our own blogs, that has really been successful. And, uh, you know, we're our food business isn't necessarily in the, the, the top segment of market share, but we're moving there quickly. But now we're trying to, you know, really position ourselves as ways to be thought of and to create a conversation. And when I, my competitors have called me and said, boy, I can tell what you guys are up to. And it's very impressive. I've known that they're taking notice. And so that, that's been, that's probably been one that's been really successful. Yeah. I think on the B2B side, if you're not doing thought leadership, content marketing right now, you're really missing the boat because there are so many good reasons to do it. Positioning yourself as an expert, uh, getting the opportunity to, to put content out there that you know your prospects are going to be interested in because they're searching for it. Your, you know, your search research shows that. I, I just really think it's, it's right on target for where we are today. And, you know, give you a little call out here. I think podcasts, you know, as you're driving down the road, you know, this is a nice way to, you know, I think as we all look at our, the podcast downloads, I just did that as I prepare for an afternoon flight going home, making sure that this is also a great way to, you know, pick up knowledge and hear what others are doing in the industry. And so kudos to you for what you're doing uh, with this content as well. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. We've, we get some good feedback and uh, we're having a good time and get to reconnect with people like you. You'll have to uh, be sure to download our most recent one on the wine industry in Missouri. Nice. Really, uh, really interesting conversation with the executive director of the Missouri Wine and Grape Board, Jim Anderson. Good communicator, but he knows a lot about wine and, and he kind of leads uh, Missouri's efforts in the wine industry. So Very if you nice. don't have that one loaded up, Absolutely. You still have time to do that. Well, and that's the thing that kind of gets frustrating. If you get on the plane, and you don't have those downloaded. You're like, okay, what am I going to do? So I thought today I'm going to get out ahead of that, make sure these are all refreshed. So anyway, 
You're a good planner. Always have been. So uh, let's, let's go even broader. You know, you as a sales and marketing guy, what other kind of cool things do you see happening in marketing today? Oh boy. You know, I, I, I just think that uh, the way we're trying to grab attention, you know, and I'm probably pretty geeky that way as I look at, uh, you know, attention spans have changed a lot. So when I, I sit and look at, uh, you know, how fast things come before us in ads, you know, those 15 second ads and you kind of look and you're like, oh my goodness, what has changed in this market? But I, I just think that's where the where we're all heading is that you got to grab attention way faster than maybe some of us that used to tell longer stories back in the day. Now we got to do it in bullets versus in paragraphs, right? So right. Uh, I, I would say I hadn't really thought about that much, Cliff. So that uh, but that's probably one that I've just seen as I watch ads and, and how they try to grab your attention has really changed over the years. Well, I agree with that. I, and I think that's a great example. The YouTube shorts the little short videos, 15, 20 seconds with the opportunity to draw you in for watching more or to take them to a website or some other outlet are really getting good results really across most every industry. Well, and then I think the measurement, uh, I look in our organization about what we're trying to do to measure and everybody's trying to measure ROI. And so now whether it's the Nielsen ratings that drive on how many, how much of us are shown watching those shows, but now hey, this is the ad, but now here's the code or the whatever it might be that you can scan. And certainly measuring that is, uh, I see it in our B2B business, but I, you know, B2C, I can only imagine about what those conversations in those conference rooms uh, and those companies look like on trying to measure the ROI on, on advertising. But, you know, I think uh, just something that might, might have popped in my head a little bit of what we're, we're tackled with is the difference between what media platforms we're in. And so, I'm, I'm, (laughs) I'm not old enough probably, but I get accused that boy, Jason likes his magazines and his newspapers. And, you know, that's what I grew up in, but I think now, uh, digital type of advertising, whatever that might be compared to the older days of, uh, you know, we got to run a full page ad for that particular trade and, you know, publication. I think that's probably another one that just comes to mind that, uh, love to share. And, and, and where the spend goes and how we've even said that we really aren't really much in the print as much as we used to be. And we're all going digital. So, yeah. And, and there's no question about it. And I, and I think a lot of what is driving that is the ability to target so well to first segment, but then target, but then be able to measure and prove, you know, we, we have other research that shows that magazines and other print materials are still effective, right? You know, Uh, which is good and bad, good in that, oh, you have all these other vehicles that you can use to reach your audience, but bad in that you can't use them all. So you got to prioritize. And, and what we have seen more and more, and we see it every year as we watch our uh, annual media buys, it's more and more going digital. And yet there is still the customer that wants to sit down in the chair and look through a magazine and, you know, just think about your, think about your mailbox. You still get catalogs, right? And I think the strategy is a little different in that you get the catalogs to drive you to a website where then you can then do your shopping and do your buying. People that pick up my backpack go, why is this thing so heavy? Well, Jason likes real books and magazines to go on the road. And so uh, the Kindle, I still like to take notes and books and still like the magazine. I've found that... uh, you know, downloading those, I kind of forget about those trade publications if they're not sitting in my mailbox. And it's just, yeah. So just, I'll have to get with the times at some point, Cliff. So, (laughs) well, you know, I I know you are a good planner and of course you're an experienced traveler. So you know what, what things to do, but what other kind of life hacks and, and habits do you use to guide your day as a sales professional? Well, you know, between the Wall Street Journal. I don't know if I've got any really decent hacks. I know that uh, certainly when it comes to traveling, I am probably on the road 150 plus days a year, 180. So, you know, from TSA now to clear, you know, uh, I'm not a very patient person. So, you know, I do pay for the, to get me through the airport even faster. Um, But, you know, certain apps that that material comes with you. I tell you, you know, I don't use Twitter as much to to share my uh, opinions because I think about your question, but what I really enjoy about Twitter is that my market research that comes to my front door, if you will, 
Uh, I can do that scrolling uh, in the back patio at night. You know, I can do that wherever that might be, where I'm tracking day to day information where we, you know, you think about the information lag of, year, of you know, many years ago, you'd have to wait for that periodical to come out weekly, daily, whatever it might be. And so I would think that that's probably one that I've always enjoyed following different uh, to really track what's going on in the pace and, you know, the, of the market. So that, that would be probably one that uh, probably specifically I'm less interested in sharing my opinions versus just tracking what's going on. So, yeah, well, that's a good one. That's a good one. Hey, I've enjoyed visiting with you today. I've uh, been looking forward to our conversation. What else would you like to share with our outdrive audience that you think they might find interesting or, or beneficial in their personal or professional life? Well, I, you know, I, I thought about that and at the end of the day, it's where, be proud of where you're from, right? As we talked earlier about innovation and things that take place in the Midwest and, you know, I, as I spend time across America, I think folks are probably realizing when they do visit, uh, you know, rural parts of America that uh, there's something wholesome. And so we, we should be unapologetic about where we're from and, uh, you know, just want to encourage people that, that uh, there's good things going on and, you know, Neighbors looking out for one another and taking care of, uh, you know, family and friends is an important deal. And so uh, that, that's probably one that, uh, you know, just to maybe reassure folks that maybe from somebody that gets to different parts of the country. So. Amen, brother. Amen. Jason, great talking to you. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Folks, thanks for listening to OutDrive. I hope you've enjoyed our visit today with Jason Robertson, Vice President of Food and Beverage at CRB. Come back again next week and I'll take you down the roads of rural America where it's heaven on earth. Thanks for taking a ride with us on OutDrive. This episode is complete, so head on over to eCallus.com for show notes and more insight you can apply to help drive your business growth. And be sure to sign up for our free monthly e-letter, OutThink, for even more helpful content about marketing to rural America. Have a great day and keep on driving.